introducing myself. Hello, I'm Sam Helmuth. I'm one of the staff here in the Department of Language and Linguistic Science. And a lot of my research um, is, is not on English. I work on other languages, but increasingly I've been working on various varieties of English. But my specialism is the bits of speech sounds that most people don't study. Um, so I, uh, linguistics, most people work in sort of grammar, syntax, and then lots, some of us work on speech. Um, and then within the speech community, most people work on consonants and vowels, frankly. I mean, there are a lot of them, they're very interesting. And there's a little small uh, rebellious group of us who work on things that are bigger than that, like stress and rhythm and intonation and that sort of thing. So I'm going to be talking about prosody today. I'll explain what it is. And you can tell me where you think it fits in with what you do in English language A-level. And I'm going to be talking about this from a piece of research I did recently on the broadcast speeches of the late Queen Elizabeth II, who I will often refer to as the Queen by mistake and forget to say the late Queen. And I apologise for that in advance to Camilla. Sorry. Um, <coughs> um, but uh, when, I, when I do that, um, I'm referring to the late Queen. And these are the lovely images that were on our coin. Some of us, I don't, I've seen those, I don't remember them. Um, but we, we all, uh, many of us in the room and online will have grown up with hearing this voice around us. Um, so the key concepts I want to persuade you about that we, we're interested in in linguistics are um, that uh, what, what, prosody, what prosody is and what prosodic features are. I think it gets called prosodics. Um, in English language circles, which isn't actually a term that we use, which I'm really interested in. We should work out um, what, uh, why that is and, and meet in the middle. Um, but I'm interested in things like word stress, sentence stress, rhythm, intonation and voice quality. And you're going to hear about voice quality again later in Joe's talk in a lot more detail. I'm mainly talking about essentially internet, how we use these, this bundle of things to tell people what we mean when we're talking. Um, and I guess one of the key things I want to bring home is that as with variation in our speech, when we look at how you pronounce your consonants and vowels, some aspects of our prosody is under our conscious control and some of it is not. And we're going to see a really simple but obvious two ways in which in the Queen's prosody some things were mm. un you know, there were some aspects that changed over time she had no control over and some which she had complete control over. And as we'll see, she really stuck to um, a, a certain way of talking. And I think in Eng English language A-level, you're often juggling those two things about when people are using language consciously and when, it, when they're using it without deliberate uh, choices and getting that divide is interesting. Whoops. So... An example of all of this is, and this is uh, one of our lead-in tasks in the classroom materials, but we'll, we'll just do it live, you don't need to look it up, um, is one of the things you could do is um, get your students to watch uh, this little clip, which I hope will work. Let's hope it does. To be or not to be, that is sorry. the question. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I mean, yes. Um, yes, but if you don't mind a note, or, or, to be, or, not to be. Try this, to be or not to be, that is the question. Don't lose focus. To be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> to be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> to be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> To be or not to be. <laughs> to be or not to be, that is the question. So um, there's a longer version of that clip that has more jokes in it. Um, and if you've got time in your classroom, you could work with that. But there's also this really nice short one that um, uh, PBS in America made. Um, so we've got this phrase, to be or not to be, that is the question. And the, what you could be doing is, uh, I'm going to get you to do this now, live, in your groups, at home or online or in the present, wherever you are. What are they doing? What are the actors doing in their speech that differs from the others? You know the answer to this, but 
that how can what are the words that you need to describe it and how does what they're doing change the meaning go you've got three minutes because we're we're just trying it out <laughs> right, everyone look like you've got an answer. <laughs> uh, I have stress. Yeah. <laughs> Pitch for some of them. Yeah, yeah. They all mean something. Choice, ever. Yeah. I'm not trying to remember so much. And hand gestures that go with the Okay, so excellent. Thank you, everybody. We've got some nice suggestions um, in the chat from people online. So maybe you might capitalize the word where you want to put stress or what we might call prominence um, in linguistics. Stress is such an ambiguous word, it can mean so many different things. Second prominence. Um, ellipsis, I guess, you know, put some dots or something, show a space, underlining. Um, you'd have to know what your own thing meant. Lots of different ideas. Any other ideas in the room here? Any? Yeah, arrows, yes, okay, yeah. All of these things are the sorts of things that those of us who work on prosody, there's, there's annual conferences about how to annotate prosody, <laughs> and no one can agree. It's quite, quite fun, anyway, but it keeps us all in jobs, um, <laughs> working it out. So that's the sort of thing you could use to sort of open up this topic for your students um, and introduce what these things are and the fact that we can change meaning with them. And I'll unpack a little bit of the detail in a minute. Um, but um, crucially, those actors are deliberately changing something in the way they deliver the same line, the same text, the same lexical string, we would call it. Um, the, yeah, um, and you can change the meaning of it by how you deliver it. And that's essentially what prosody is. It's much more fun than all the other bits. So we're going to look at um, some aspects of how the Queen did this. So why the Queen? Um, well, uh, those linguists, we benefit from the fact that we can look at individual language use over the lifespan by taking advantage of the naturally occurring corpus data of uh, a few public figures whose voice has been recorded over multiple decades. Um, and one of those is the Queen. Um, I really like this picture of the Queen aged 17 to remind your students that the Queen was 17 once. Um, um, and most of them will only have uh, experienced her if they, you know, increasingly they, students won't remember the Queen, um, the late Queen. Um, but um, most of them will have only seen her in that older age. So there have been studies of the Queen's speech in various aspects because of all these recordings. Um, and another one that is often studied is David Attenborough because he started out pretty young with Zoo World or Zoo, some, some TV programme with a cockatoo on his head. Um, and obviously he's still going um, at, um, into his 90s now. Um, there's one other very common one who we'll meet um, later, Alistair Cook. Um, and why am I studying the Queen? Well, practically it was because... The study I'm telling you about is one I was asked to do for a BBC programme, which you've got the link to on the, um, on the web page for this case study. It was a programme that aired after the Queen died. Um, it's an interesting mix of things, but there's some linguistics in the middle of it as well, and I talk about these, these things. Um, but the, the really famous studies, which you may well be aware of, and if you're not, you'll, you'll love these, um, there was a big study that was published in the year 2000 in Nature, which is one of the biggest um, journals uh, in science. Um, and um, the, the, the title was, Does the Queen Speak the Queen's English? 
and they showed that they, they looked at her monop thongs so those are her her vowels which don't have a change in them so leaving out vowels like i and ow and o but the the sort of straight vowels it's were e Eh, ah, the short ones and the long ones, and most of those had changed. So they looked at a period of 50 years, 1952 to 2002. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. The sounds are clipping a little bit, so I will have to do my best impression of the Queen, which is always um, entertaining. Um, so one of them was what we call the goose vowel. So you may know that in sociolinguistics we use these lexical keywords to refer to certain vowels. So goose is that oo vowel. And I'm saying it in my very, my age group, ooh, quite fronted. Um, but here is uh, the Queen saying new, I hope. New. <laughs> so she was 31 in that recording. And in this one, new. 76. Yeah, and you can hear it's, it's new, new, and new. It's sort of fronting um, and changing much, it sounds much more normal. Uh, the second one, that, that first one does sound quite posh, old, I don't know. Yeah, from a different era. Um, the trap vowel, so that's the vowel in words like hat, bat, cat, um, has lowered and back. So we've got the word happy from I, lots of these things have happy Christmas and, the, and a merry new year or whatever it is. So I've got new and happy. Um, so this, I hope, is happy. Whoop. Happy. Yeah, so you should hear that early one, age 31, is like happy, happy, Princess Anne, which I wouldn't say, and then more like happy Anne, yeah. So that lowered and backed over time. And these changes were in the direction of the change that was going on in the speech community of Southern Standard British English at the same time. But she was sort of behind the curve, so she wasn't leading the change, she was following the change and was a little bit uh, behind it. And the same pattern of change over time uh, in the direction of the change that's in the community um, was found in some other studies. So another one looked at those ow, a, the change of shape diphthong vowels, the overall shape of her vowel space, which linguists get very excited about, um, and then another vowel, the happy vowel. So happy refers to that e sound at the end of happy. Um, and you should, if you listen again to happy, be able to hear that that has also changed as well as the trap row. Happy. Happy. It's more e e. It's it's got short. What it probably sounds more like a short e vowel than a long e vowel. <coughs> no, the other way around. Um, yeah, happy, not happy. So, uh, what about her consonants? Well, there has been one study recently of her R's. Um, so. Um, the Queen never used intrusive R at any point. Well, what's intrusive R? It is when you insert an R between two words that end and start with a vowel. It only happens after certain vowels, um, but in the phrase, the very idea of it, I would naturally insert a little R sound there, idea of it, yeah? And many people do, but the Queen never did uh, in any of her recordings. And then she used linking R, which is where you do that, but the, the word, the first word actually has an R at the end of it in the spelling. So we, in some sense, we, we think there ought to be an R there. So linking R, um, she actually used that less over time. So uh, got a couple of examples here. So this is um, from when she was 31 again. As they are at this moment. So she's saying, as they are at this moment. But she says, as they are at, are at, yeah? As they are at this moment. Yeah, that's when she's saying, my, my family often watch television, as they are at this moment. Yeah, sorry, it's the orphan, gets me every time. Um, and this is age 76, and she, she doesn't link. Whoops, where's it gone? From your own experience. She says, from your own experience. And she doesn't say, from your own experience from your own and you if you listen carefully you might just hear that little catch of a glottal stop your own and that's what we would call glottalization to break up that vowel hiatus from your own experience from your own experience that diphthong is very o still but from your own experience and that pattern is also in the direction of change in the wider speech community and um, um, 
linking art and intrusive art are one of the things we're studying in the Generations of London English project that I'm part of. So I'll come back in a couple of years' time with some results on that because it's really changing. Listen on the BBC. When, they, when the ashes comes around, the ashes, which I would say the ashes, the West Indian announcer says the ashes, the, ash, the ashes. And I go, oh. Anyway, it's not on R, but anyway. Um, you can also learn more about linking R and intrusive R if you're interested and changing attitudes to it in our toolkit case study called Rogue R. Um, that's a very nice study showing that with lots of nice old quotes um, saying how people talked in a rough and bawdy way, inserting R's. Um, were these vowel changes and other changes permanent? There's a very recent study uh, which looked at some more recordings after 2002 and actually showed that the Queen's accent was sort of turning back on itself, doing accent reversion. Um, and in later years, um, after about the age of 65 onwards, it started to sort of head back. Um, trap, goose and happy, those three vowels, had all moved roughly halfway back. So they didn't go all the way back to where they were when she was in her 20s and 30s, but they were roughly halfway back. Um, back towards their more, what we might call, conservative uh, phonetic properties. Um, and uh, we can hear that, so I think this is, I've got the happies for you again. Happy. So that's 31, age 31. Happy. I think that's age 76. And then this last one is age 91. Happy. And can you hear it's gone hit? Happy, it's gone back a bit, yeah. So it is quite audible, interesting. Um, why would this be? <gasps> Hold that thought. If you're interested in that, then sign up for our Citizen Science Initiative, which is going to be launching over the summer, um, and you and your students can have some... Uh, help me collect some data on this. Um, but, yeah, I, if you're interested, I'll tell you on the break. But there is a, an, a very interesting story about why that might be. One of the things, why, why on earth do linguists study this stuff um, uh, other than when the BBC asks them to? So one reason is because we can use these longitudinal corpora to disentangle the sources of variation in an individual's speech. So one of the things I will talk about in the September thing is this sort of, the sort of two, the trajectory of an individual's lifespan change of their accent, some of which is due to physiological changes, and some of which is due to changes in the speech community they're part of, and which speech communities they're in contact with. It is very, very interesting. So we all have this weird trajectory that we're on, and it may or may not move at the same speed as the, the speech community, the, the Queen was, was sort of slower. Um, but there is another explanation for the pattern we've just heard of happy becoming happy, which we need to rule out as linguists before we can say that really her speech changed. So the, the plots you can see here are um, of Queen Elizabeth II and also Alastair Cook, who uh, some of you may remember was on the radio every week for a very long time. It's the world's longest running speech radio program. And if you go to that link, you can download loads of them. So if you need sample material for your students to play with, it's sitting there. Um, so Alastair Cook was uh, studied in this study and what you have in these two plots is the age of the speaker going along what we call the x-axis along the bottom, uh, so 30 to sort of uh, 80 here and then 40 to 90 something here. And you can see and that this, this line here is their pitch, the average pitch in their speech. And you can see that that's doing what we probably would expect. If I asked you if, if I asked you, Does, do people's pitch go up or down as they get older, you might never have thought about it before, but as soon as you do think about it, you'd think, oh, actually, that's interesting. People's We know that children have very high-pitched voices, and they gradually, over time, um, they, it, they get lower. And that's, um, that's what we see here. So the Queen's uh, average pitch fell over time, and then Alastair Cook's that fell over time, and then in his very late years, sort of 85 onwards, it did what is common in older men, which is that the pitch, average pitch actually goes up again. And you can discuss in the break why that might be. A simple way of thinking about it is that there's, there's nowhere else to go. They can't go any lower. <laughs> um, because 
on average, male pitch range is a little bit lower. Joe will be talking more about that um, uh, after lunch. Um, this measure up here is a measurement that we can take in linguistics, which is a proxy for the height of your vowel. So do you say N, which is quite a high vowel, N or AN, which is a bit low? If you go AR, you should feel your jaw opening, your tongue lowering. Yeah, AR. So, and the properties of that, what we're measuring is the resonant frequencies of your, the space inside your mouth. Who knew? It's very easy to measure, actually. You don't actually put things in your mouth and measure. Uh, we do it from the acoustic signal. Um, but that is a multiple, mathematically, of your pitch. So if your pitch goes down, your, the first form and this measure of vowel height also naturally falls, roughly speaking, over time. So what they had to do in this study of the Queen's speech was rule out the fact that it changed from E to A, Princess N, Princess Anne, just because pitch was falling. And they did a clever study and showed that actually those, those two measures, it's not, you can't exactly predict the one from the other. Now, that's not something that you will necessarily worry about in English language A level, but just so you know, it's the sort of detail we actually have to think about. We have to rule out other explanations of things. And that's a very good general principle to be aware of in linguistic analysis. Um, but my eyes lit up when I saw this because that pitch, that's my domain. <laughs> Prosody, let's have a look. Yeah, so I, it's interesting. We, we knew that the Queen's pitch had fallen. Um, I, I don't need to show you those. So what other factors might we need to disentangle um, from the pitch? You know, what they've just shown her pitch has gone down. Where I'm interested in, where were they measuring that? And is there some other explanation of some of that that they should have taken into account? So we uh, saw with Hamlet, when we're speaking, what do we use changes in pitch for, where we saw that we can change the shape of our pitch contour or the relative prominence we give to certain words to change meaning at the level of the sentence in English. We do that a lot. I'm doing it now all the time. But the other thing I'm doing now in my speech all the time is using pitch and other things like tempo and pausing to indicate the structure of my talk at the level of what I'm going to call discourse. There's a lot of words we could give that, but I'm going to call it discourse for, for today, the sort of chunks of flowing speech. Um, and we're going to talk in detail about how we do that, but I am doing it all the time, and it's helping you work out where I am in my thought process. So if I keep going down with me on pitch, you know that this is an ongoing part of the current idea. But eventually, once I've stopped doing this explanation, I'll do a complete pitch reset and show that I'm starting a new topic eventually. If I keep going off, I'll stop now. So, pitch reset. Um, I'm telling you this is a new topic or a new paragraph, you might think of, a new sequence of sentences that I'm talking about. Just for the record, other languages um, use pitch in all of those ways. But in addition, many languages, in fact, most of the languages in the world also use pitch to change meaning at the level of the word. And you'll probably all be familiar with examples of like Mandarin, where you can have a sequence of words where if you listen to these and imagine this was intonation in English, it, we would be saying, really? Oh, are you sure? De sort of things like that with our pitch. But actually, these are changing the meaning of the word to mother, hemp, horse, and skull. You don't want to mix some of those up. Ma, 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 scold. <laughs> anyway, so, um, and you may have students in your classes who speak um, as a, an additional language. Um, um, a language with tone, and they would be very interesting people to talk to. Um, I'm going to be talking about this, how we use pitch and other, other aspects of our prosody to structure our talk at the level of discourse. Um, so I'm going to dive in straight to the study of the Queen so we don't uh, lose time, but we will unpack a little bit through the extension task what's going on. So this was quite a small study. I took a sample of just five recordings uh, for the radio programme, and I am working on a bigger study with 
more samples over time. Um, and I've got samples starting at the age of 21. So that was her famous 21st birthday broadcast where she promised whether her life was short or long it would be for our service. Um, and then a, the Christmas broadcast in 1957, which was the first one that was ever done uh, on the television. And she did it live to camera. A astonishing, really. Just She just um, did it. Um, and then a, we jumped to, into her 60s, a speech to Commonwealth Day. Um, which was to an audience, um, but probably in quite a formal setting. And then in 1992, we've got the Guildhall speech given on the 40th anniversary of her accession, which is quite famous. Some of you may have heard of that one. That's the Annus Horribilis speech, where she'd, it had been a bad year in so many ways. Um, and she talked about that. And uh, we will see that that speech does stand out a little bit um, in some of the measures. Um, for reasons could be just it was a bad bad topic it was a bad day bad week you can also hear in the recording that she's audibly hoarse she's got a cold um and also she was giving this speech at a dinner so it's it's a public speech but it's slightly different from a sort of formal hall meeting maybe i don't know so i was interested in the extent to which the audience uh, might influence uh, the way she delivered her speeches. And then the last one I've got is the Christmas broadcast from 2017. But these all have in common, they are a very restricted discourse genre, really. They're all scripted. They're all monologues. They were all definitely scripted, definitely rehearsed, almost certainly planned carefully. And they were mostly live or for broadcast, some pre-recorded, uh, some given live. And I did what linguists do, which is get recordings and then annotate things. We label things in them. So I labelled something that we would call an intonation phrase, which is a fairly transparent term. It's a chunk that's obviously one sort of intonational tune. Um, and uh, I labelled those, those chunks. And then I, I also labelled, by definition, the gaps between them, some of which had nothing in them, and that makes it a pause. And we would refer to that as an unfilled pause. You can have filled pauses, as you know, which things like um and er in them. There are no ums and ers in the Queen's broadcast. It's impressive. It's, I mean, that takes control. Um, but there are none, not even in the, the live ones. And then the other thing I labelled was the discourse category of each phrase. And I used a labelling scheme. Uh, if you go to the paper, you can see the references from it. It was first invented by um, a woman called Anne Wichmann, who's done most of the pioneering work in an analysis of discourse prosody, and then picked up by um, a PhD student, um, Ma uh, Meg Zellers, who did a lovely piece of work on it. And what we're labelling here is we're looking at the content of the talk, the text, not how it was necessarily... But, and, and, this, this sentence or this clump of sentences, this, this intonation phrase, where is it in the paragraph? Is it a new topic? Is it the start of a new topic? Is it new information on the same topic? Yeah, which is called an addition. Is it yet more detail about something, sort of elaboration? And then the last one is the, the completing one. Is it obviously the end of, 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 the, of the, an idea? And you'll see that those, and I've put them in sort of red to blue. I hope you can see that in the various places in which you can see the slides. Um, so that T for topic, that's the sort of dark red. And then the C continuation is the dark blue. So I labelled those. And these are the things that are going to, we're going to see that the Queen is doing a lot of work to mark these with her prosody, as we all do, as I'm doing now, as you do every day. But we don't even think about it. Yep. Um, and then I did some measurements, and I, there is going to be some maths. It'll be fine. Bear with me. Um, so you're going to see some graphs showing her pitch, which I, you'll see it's called maximum F0. So F0 is the fundamental frequency. It's the rate of vibration of your vocal folds. And if my vocal folds are vibrating relatively slowly, my pitch is low. And if I speed them up a bit, it goes higher. Um, and, um, and you do that by more airflow and stretching your muscles to um, 
yeah, stretch the vocal folds. I'm going to show you articulation rate, which is a very common measure used in linguistics and particularly in forensic context because it's something that is quite individual to people. Uh, people uh, have a preferred uh, speed, roughly speaking. Ask James more about that. He's the forensic person here. Um, and that is the count of how many syllables per second. And what you do is you count the syllables in a, an utterance and then you measure how long the utterance was in seconds and do that very simple sum. Everybody can manage that. Divide the number of syllables by the number of seconds. Um, and the pitch is probably something your students wouldn't want to be measuring, but they could probably do it by hearing. You know, is this high or low relatively? But syllables per second is something they could definitely measure if they were interested um, because it's very easy to do. And then the next one, again, is something students could really easily do, is the number of words or syllables in a phrase. Um, you just count them. I, I can count them. They can count them. We, I, that's what I did. Um, and then the duration of that phrase. So you just measure how long it was and the duration of any following pause. So you're going to see those measures. And this uh, paper just uh, came out at a... Um, a conference which happened a couple of weeks ago where all the people in the world in that tiny niche group of people who work on prosody all got together and raged and roared about prosody. It was great. Um, so what did the Queen do? Let's look at her pitch. And this, if you had a single picture that sums up what the Queen was doing, this is it. I love it. <laughs> I had to do it in red, white and blue, roughly speaking. <laughs> um, so you can see that as in that pitch that we saw in the earlier study comparing the Queen Elizabeth II and Alastair Cook, um, um, the, the, her pitch is falling over time. So her, you can see that her, the maximum pitch in anywhere in her utterances was about 450 hertz, which is relatively high, but not. It's sort of up there somewhere. Um, <laughs> um, and, um, but by... Um, when she was uh, 91, the maximum pitch anywhere was 350 hertz. So it's fallen 100 hertz, which is roughly where we would expect it to be. This isn't a measure of her lowest pitch at any point. Remember, I'm measuring the highest pitch in all of the phrases just to, as a quick and dirty measure. Um, but that's not as, as low. She, her pitch did, will have gone lower than that because this is, this is still quite, quite high. Um, and it falls over time. It's a bit flat here because there's, there's only a sort of three year, two, two or three years apart in age here, and then falls uh, lower. But the separation of the colours is, you should be really clear and, and beautiful. Not only clear, but beautiful. I'm going to move this thing out of the way so you can see it. Where shall I put it? I don't know where to put it. Um, so the T for topic, you can see that as has been shown in all other studies of, uh, certainly of English uh, prosody in discourse, topics are produced with higher pitch and then you step down and you step down and then the last phrase in a, in a sequence of connected sentences in what you might call a discourse paragraph is with lower pitch. And the separation of those doesn't change. And this is that scary looking uh, axis label over there estimated marginal means means that this is a statistic I've, this this is the results of modeling the data statistically and there was there's no difference um, over time in the degree of separation between those uh, colors and that's I could stop there because she just she found a way to do it and she didn't didn't change um, and it may be I don't know that everybody does this and I do intend to look at some of these other speakers, David Attenborough, Alastair Cook, and see whether this is a particular thing of doing being the queen, that one goes on being the same one's whole life, or whether this is a property of discourse itself. It could be either, um, and that's an interesting question. Um, so, so notice how consistent the queen was in her use of pitch to indicate the structure of the speech, 70 years um, and counting, alongside that natural lowering of pitch with age. If we look at her speaking rate, so her, the speed of her speech, articulation rate, this might look as though it's varying, but those, those tall sort of bars there, these black lines here, the fact that they all overlap with each other, they're roughly, there's, there's actually no difference at all over time in her speaking rate from age 21 
to age 91. Not at all. The one that looks different is 1992. And you can see that it looks like she's got... This is the number of syllables per second. So she's got a smaller number of syllables per second, roughly, in 1992 than the other. So that's a bit slower. Yeah? It's actually not statistically significantly different, but this is quite a small sample. But it, it, in a bigger sample, it might pull away. But, but something looks like it might have been going on, and we'll see what that is in a moment. The other thing to notice is that these pale blue ones, the elaborations, we speed up in those to get them in, you know? Because if I'm at the start of a topic, you're interested. I've done a big pitch, blah, 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 and more about this, and I'm really going to tell you more than you really don't want to know, so I'm going to speed up a little bit, and then I... And that's quite, it's not a huge difference, not a significant difference, but it's consistent. And then the size and the length of phrases. So I've just given you the number of words per phrase and the durations. We tend to plot durations sort of flipped because time goes left to right, so we plot them on the axis the other way. And you can see that these differences are real. So she had... Fewer words per phrase in 1992 in that public speech with a croaky voice. And she, but her phrases were shorter. So how did she achieve that consistent speed? Well, I think there must have been some planning going on. <laughs> I think she marked up her script. I, I don't know. We don't know. We'll never know. Um, so it looks like that whatever she was doing, she was adjusting the size of the phrases in terms of the number of words. And perhaps in, she deliberately said, right, I'm going to just slow down a bit and I'm going to have shorter phrases um, over time. We don't know. I'm speculating. Um, so that's the only difference, is that in that one speech, the phrases are shorter and they've got fewer words in them. And that is a way of sticking to the same speed. How are we doing for time? And then, last but not least, the pauses. So this is the length of the pause after each phrase. And she was really consistent. Again, these black lines are completely overlapping. There's no difference over time here at all. This, these look like big changes, but they, they're not. They are, they're just um, small changes that aren't significantly different. But what is interesting is that these dark blue ones over here, so the last phrase in a discourse chunk has a longer pause after it, which as soon as I say that, you go, well, of course it would, um, but it does, <laughs> so, um, really um, pretty consistently. And then all of the other things, the things that are not final in a chunk have a shorter pause. I don't know, was she did she time her pauses? I doubt it. I think she just, you know, how we, we all do this. Some of this is um, a mix of conscious control and just how speech is normally structured. So these are aspects of speech that you might never have thought about, um, but I think they are quite interesting. To summarise for the Queen, let's move my head out of the way of the late Queen's head. We need her, not me. Um, so no change over time in how she used, how she deployed prosody to mark discourse structure in these very high-profile broadcast speeches. We've got that expected age-related decline over the lifetime in decline in F0, not in other faculties. Um, <laughs> expected variation by per position in the discourse structure and no change over time in speech tempo or speech rate. And then the pause length is really about discourse structure. So really consistent cues, but within a very restricted discourse genre. This is... I mean, it's very limited. It's almost like, who else? It's, you know, the king now does this. You know, a few other monarchs, maybe. Um, highly stable prosodic performance by the late Queen over this really lengthy period. Um, so a question I have now, which will be, I think, is interesting for your students, perhaps, is when discourse structure does vary in the way that we've seen with the actors, you can do... You have all that control. I think of all the different ways you could deliver one Hamlet soliloquy. There's, it's almost an infinite number of ways you could do it. Is that due to the speaker or is it due to the genre? And I think there will be a bit from each, yeah? So I think some of why the Queen's speeches were so prosodically, almost sort of, you know, it was like they were just unchanged. It's partly it's, it's the genre. It was, it was really sort of hemming that in. 
but it may also have been her personal choice performance style to do this. I have measured her father. So we've got some speeches by George VI, who was very famously, you know, the King's Speech and all that had to be coached. And the pace and all of that is very different from her father. And I haven't got so many speeches from him to do in comparison over time. I'm not sure I'm going to last long enough to do um, many for, for Charles. But I think I will look at David Attenborough and um, uh, Alistair Cook. So in the last bit, I'm just going to give you a preview of the extension task. So one of the things we've said, what, where we've gone for, you can tell us if you think we should have gone in a different direction, is to think about, I think this would be a very useful place to get your students thinking about structuring their text, their writing, and, how, and the role of punctuation in that, in a sense. You know, it's a good place to re revise commas. Um, <clears throat> and um, so one of the tasks is we've given you an un, a raw, unpunctuated transcript of a broadcast, and the suggested task is to put the punctuation in where you think it should be. And because we use roughly, we're using commas to mark sort of short pauses and then full stops between sentences. But they might also want to go crazy and use some other semicolons and colons and things and to add paragraph breaks. So, so this is a, it was a text, the, the, the sort of COVID broadcast, as it were. Um, and uh, you can, I won't get you to do it now, even though I think we did print some out. Sorry, James, I've witted on too much. Um, but uh, what you would do is get them to label this up. Here, this is a slide taken from our first year sort out their grammar module. Um, <laughs> um, it's not what it's called. <laughs> um, what's the difference between a sentence and a clause? I thought I'd throw this in. In linguistics, we really talk about clauses, and I'm not sure you do at English language A level. But if you go to Englicious, they also are singing the praises. So they've got a really nice uh, set of materials that translate between the terminology of the national curriculum of simple compound complex sentences and sort of give a sort of mapping between that and something that is linguists use because it's much easier to use and count so a clause is easy to spot because it's something with one verb one lexical verb not a auxiliary verb a main sort of doing verb <coughs> and and then all the stuff that goes with it the obligatory arguments like subjects and objects and any optional extras you might want to throw in extra phrases and a sentence is either one clause or a sequence of clauses either compounded together with and or subordinated together in some way. And you, you know that stuff, but... Um, um, and what we tell our students is, in writing, a sentence is everything between two major punctuation marks, which is all right. I could live with that as a, as, a, as a way of finding things. So you could work with this and chunk it up. We've given you the answers, i.e. on the, 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 the handout, which is... It's, we haven't got the Queen's personal script with her manual. I wonder if those will ever come out with the markings on. But what we have got is the text of the press release, which has some punctuation in it and paragraphs and things like that you can compare to. But you can also compare to the actual speech. I'm speaking to you at what I know is an increasingly challenging time. Listen to that happy bell. Challenging. Anyway, um, she was quite old then. Yeah. And so the red is the answers, as it were. And the crucial question really is, um, is whether, whether this was the only way to say it. And the answer is, no, clearly it's not. Um, there, were, there were other ways you could deliver this speech within a limited range. You can't randomly put pauses in the middle of uh, bits of meaning. Um, and then we've got um, a task with some spontaneous speech to do the same task, see if you can predict, you know, from that transcript where people might have paused and what they would do. And we'll pick up on this issue of transcripts um, in uh, James's talk later in the day. And then a little task where they can find some writing of their own and read it to each other and see if the person reads it the way they meant, them, meant it to be. Yeah, just think about ambiguity, that sort of thing. Um, and I've put some really nice, useful resources on that handout to review of sent that Englishious one, um, a really nice review from the University of Sussex on punctuation, which is great. I actually like, oh, this is really useful. Um, and then um, BBC Bite Size has just a really nice, simple review thing of sort of, it's actually for Scottish exams, but I, it's on critical reading, it's quite good. 
Um, if we have time, I could. Um, un we've got an example we could look at for clause structure. Um, but I will try and leave at least some time for questions. So we've seen that there's more to prosody than we thought. It's not just questions going up and statements going down, which is where everybody goes to, and it turns out that's not even true. They sometimes go up, and not all questions do it. Um, but we're doing a lot more with our prosody. And as with variation in our consonants and vowels, some aspects are under our conscious control and some are not, and it's probably quite tightly woven. And I think that a speaker's freedom to vary discourse structure is quite dependent on the genre of the where, where they're giving that talk. And the Queen didn't have a lot of room for Nuva, perhaps, um, and or she chose to do being the Queen the way she did uh, very consistently. Thank you very much. Any questions? Oh, thank you very much. So we have seven minutes for questions. Are there any questions, either here or online? So if you're online, you can put them on the Q&A button or in the... George will organise you. Can I just... Uh, yes, please. There was something going on in 1992 which might suggest variations in what the Queen was doing. Could you talk a bit more about that? Um, it, from what I measured, so the question was what was going on in the 1992 speech. It's the only one where I saw a change in tempo, speaking rate what we call articulation rate. And, um, but it went around with, it wasn't a, a significant difference, but it was a dip, it was a trend towards slightly slower. But it went around with, on average, her phrases were shorter. They had fewer words in them and they were in time shorter. So I think she just put some extra lines in the script because she had a cold. It's a guess. Yeah, you, you did what uh, we all might do, is say, I'm feeling I have to give this speech because <laughs> it's 40 years since I became a queen and I'm not feeling very well, but I'm going to turn out and do it. But if you listen to it, it's, um, it was a pretty miserable speech. There's some hilarious pictures. I haven't put them on because it's, you know, of, the, of Prince Philip <laughs> watching this speech. Um, <laughs> which I commend to you. Um, yeah. Um, so that, that's all I, I know. And I haven't looked at more than this sample. It is quite a small sample. But I was really surprised. And the BBC were very happy because this is such a lovely counterexample to that. Um, her accent was changing. She was sort of down with the people in her accent. She was changed. She was sounded quite a lot less posh over time, as it were. But her, the job of just doing being the Queen, sounding like the Queen, turning out at Christmas, telling us stuff about the Commonwealth, didn't change. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a, like a sort of non-result, which isn't very exciting in linguistics, but it's still interesting. So. But having said that, the thing you might take away from this is all that lovely stuff about the Queen's accent changing, which is fine. I, that's why I put a lot, a lot in there for you, because I knew that might be what you're most interested in. Um, and the, that paper that you saw, Does the Queen Speak the Queen's English, is free to download. You'll, you'll find that really easily. We'll put a link to it, maybe, in the materials. Um, yeah. Da, da, da. references if you're interested that's the that's this one it's very easy to find um, and most of this work has been done by a guy called Jonathan Harrington who's in based in the university in, he's British but he's based in a university in Germany da, da, da. are we barking up the right tree with those activities are there, can you see some use in there I imagine reviewing commas might not be a terrible thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and just noticing that um, there's um, there's a in work on prosody, people talk about comma intonation. Some people have said it's a thing that you can hear a comma. It's like a continuation rise. It's but not a full. So roughly speaking, we this is very common cross linguistically is that non-final chunks of talk will tend to not go low. So if I haven't finished yet, I'll go up at the end a little bit. And now what I'm doing is projecting more talk 
Um, and if you're interested in that, you can see any of the case studies on our website about um, uh, conversation analysis. So there's a very nice one on questions and answers. Um, and also what people do in how long the pause is, depending on whether people are answering the question in the way they think the person asking the question wants them to. So a, a sort of um, expected or unexpected answer, roughly speaking. And that's, again, that's something people don't think about. We don't do it on purpose, but it's very consistent in people's uh, speech behaviour. Cool. Could I ask? Yes. Um, listening to you, one thing I'd, I'd kind of realise about uh, our teaching of phonology is we kind of duck teaching vowels in a really systematic way. And it's kind of, I, I, I do know that, like, the, the keyword stuff about, you know, that the uh, bat trap split and things like that. Yep. And it just seems uh, just a few examples. And I, and, and, and I have to research all, you know, kind of the, is it the vowel quadrilang quadrilanguals yep. in, in, in those diagrams. Well, I haven't quite integrated it into any resources yet that students can use. I mean, what is the best way of doing it? It seems like it's all a bridge too far sometimes when we're teaching accents and we're teaching child language acquisition. Uh, it just feels like we're not quite there yet. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'm looking to George at the back, who's, and James, of course, are our resident, and well, and Claire, but Claire does grammar. But yeah, so George and James do vowels. Um, I think vowels are. When we're teaching phonetics to first years, we actually do the vowels first because they are a bit harder. You can't feel, like if you're teaching p or k, you can feel what's going on because your bits are hitting each other. Um, but in a vowel, you're making a tiny position, change in the position of your tongue and you don't feel that and you don't think about it, but it's, it's, yeah, it's making a huge change. When I used to teach Arabic pronunciation, I used to put a nuttles minto on your tongue, and you can feel it. But anyway, <laughs> um, other sweets are available. Um, uh, but it goes kind of a bit funny then. But you do at least feel where your tongue is. Um, I would say George did a lovely talk last year on mapping dialects. You've got so the way they operationalized vowels in the mapping di our dialects project is by looking at what rhymes or not. And that is quite accessible. Most people can say, does the foot and strut rhyme for you or not? And they don't for me, but they probably do for lots of you and lots of you at home. And that is a way of tapping into people's knowledge without them having to think about where their tongue is. Because you don't need to think about where your tongue is for English language A-level. It's not, there's, there's no phonet core phonetics in there. Um, so that's the one I would point you to immediately. But also to... But it's also fair to say that I think there's more variation in vowels in English dialects than there is in consonants. So entirely skirting it is, is a missed opportunity. So maybe the Queen is a place to start. You know, just, you know, I can put some clips on there. Just that happy, happy, happy evolution is quite interesting. And the citizen science thing I'm going to do in uh, September, there'll be some classroom materials that you can do a, a a lesson in class if you want to and then or it can be a take-home thing for the students if you haven't got time but that will be about this business of it's focused on when does an individual's trajectory of change line up with the speech community which I think is quite an interesting thing to think about in social linguistics where we all are on our own little train routes and the, we form a community and we're all you know we changing with the community and who's leading the change and who's behind the curve and all this um, and that we'll be doing um, a perception study, which is essentially guess the age of the queen um, <laughs> in recordings. And then you'll help me to collect data. But crucially, I want to get the ears of younger and older people. So the students would be filling it in themselves, but then getting their mums and dads and grannies and grandpas to do it. And then we'll look at whether your own age influences your perception. Does that help at all? A bit. Ask George and... Um, James at home. Question, yes, sorry. One more in the room, and if there are any online, tell me, George. Yeah, I, uh, it's going to be a little bit disjointed because I'm picking up bits from all sorts That's of That's fine. Things. So I was talking to my students. We started looking at the great vowel shift. Yep. And they were saying that they were struggling with it because they didn't know where they were going to put it. Yep. And then they were saying that they were struggling with it because they didn't know where they were going to put it. And how it kind of um, meant that some of what was understood in language and in text was no longer understood because of the Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, I've taught as an EAL teacher in Thailand, 
Um, so and try to learn Thai and and you know kind of that you know kind of having uh, the same. To me, it sounds exactly the same, but could mean eight different things. You know that kind of thing. And I'm wondering if we are now going through a, a, again a more evolutionary change in the way that we pronounce and change, and that again is going to change meaning. It's kind of a little bit out there, but yeah. So well, are we in a second great vowel shift? Yeah. I'm going to leave that with George to mull over, and then we'll answer it at the end of the break, I think, because that's. I don't think we are. I don't think the changes are as big, because the thing about the great, it was a chain, you know, which often yeah. happens in languages. That ever, it's happened in North America. There's this big sort of moving around. It's happening in Arabic dialects at the moment, but you, never mind. Um, <laughs> but I think English has done it, and I'm... I, you know, so it's true that in certain North American, there's the great North American city, city what's it called, cities northern shift, city shift, the northern cities shift. So what we could do maybe is dig out some materials on that because that's a more recent shift, which is similar to the Great Vowel Shift, but yeah. but but contemporary. Any questions online? <laughs>